Good morning, Grace Church. Thank you guys so much for being here with us today. Would you all stand up? We're going to worship together. Come on, let's put our hands together.
this song talks about fighting the dark. You know what I love about Jesus? Is when we surrender to Jesus, no matter what darkness, no matter what hardship we have in our life, we surrender it to him and we give it to him and allow him to fight for us, not our own power. He's fighting a battle that he's already won. He already won that battle. And I know that there's people in this room and online who feel like you might be in a season of darkness where you're battling something. And some of the requests that have come in, one specific for Deb, who is just in back pain. And we are going to pray for her, and we're going to pray for every other request that's represented in this room and online. And give it to Jesus and ask for his will to be done. Amen? Father God, we love you. We come in the name of your son, Jesus, lifting all these requests up to you, God. We lift Deb up to you. Pray for your healing hand to be on her, for you to move in people's lives, God. For your hand of peace to rest on shoulders who need it. And Father, we come to you and just pray for our country, especially the West Coast that fires are burning right now, God. We pray for everyone affected, that you would move in the midst of trials, God, in the midst of struggles, bring restoration. We just pray for your will to be, be done, God, for you to continue to move. We ask this all in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you check the screens out and take a seat. Hey there. Welcome to Grace. We're so glad you're here. If you're new, we want to meet you and connect with you and help you find home here. The best way to do that is for you to text the word connect me with no spaces to 411-247. You can put in prayer requests or ask questions and someone will be in touch. Another great place to start is to check out the seven minute meeting. It happens just after service right here in the worship center under the balcony. You can meet with a pastor and learn more about what we do. And if you're online, you can text that same connect me with no spaces to 411-247 and check the box that says, I'd like a call today. We have a class on why we do what we do and you're invited. 
Pastor Dan teaches a class called Life at Grace, and the next one is on August 4th at 6.30. There's dinner and childcare provided, and you can sign up by texting the word Life at Grace with no spaces to 411-247. Come check out some classic cars right here at Grace for Hot August Sunday. On August 8th, there will be yummy treats and lots of fun before and after all three services. If you've got a sweet ride that you want to show off, let us know. Just email cars at gracechurchreno.org. Also on August 8th, baptisms are happening at the 9, 11, and 6 p.m. services. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward decision to follow Jesus. If you want to get baptized, you can text the word baptism to 411-247 and we'll get you all the details. We can't wait to cheer you on in this very special moment. Now that we're looking into August, mark your calendar for Reno Love Day on August 29th. Services that Sunday will be canceled so we can be out in the city showing the love of Jesus by cleaning up at a wild park. More details on that are coming soon. Thanks for being here. Awesome. So much great stuff going on. And that was Allie on the, the, the video. We love Allie. She's on staff here. And did you notice the shirt she was wearing? She was wearing a kids camp shirt. She actually worked at kids camp last week, had a small group of kids. We actually captured this video of her. Check this out to give you a little behind the scenes what Allie did. Right into the suds. Look at, they just douse her with the hose afterwards too. Yeah, kids camp. Uh, kids camp's going awesome. It's been a phenomenal couple weeks. We've done two already. We have another one coming up this week. And it's been just amazing to see so many kids come to campus and just have a great experience. And speaking of kids, I don't know if you guys know this, we have an amazing kids ministry here at Grace Church. And we meet for every service, 9, 11, and 6. And all the stuff that they talk about that in those services is directed for kids so they can learn about Jesus and what he does, but in a way that they'll understand. The leaders are prepared. The teachers are prepared. It's an awesome experience. And I'll just say that, like, they know what they're doing with for kids. Who knows what Dan's going to say up here? You know, <laughs> who knows what he's going to say? It's just an awesome experience for kids. So if you want to check that out, have your kids check it out. It's a great opportunity. And we can continue to do all these amazing things in the community, like camps and Reno Love, because of your generous giving. And every week we just put a slide up on the screen and just give you a little time to seek God and what he might be asking you to step into in this area. So we're going to do that now and then we'll continue worship in just a second. As many of you guys know, Pat Barrett is coming in September. He's coming September 16th. It's going to be an amazing night. And this next song that we're going to sing, Build My Life, was written by him. Um, so I'd just love it if you guys would sing along with me and just let's prepare our hearts for a night of worship with him. It's going to be so great and it's going to be so heartfelt. And I just can't wait to be in community with all of you guys and just praising God together. So would you all stand and let's just continue to worship. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Jesus, the only one who could 
What an amazing truth that is, that you and I have this, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we have this unshakable sense about us that we just can't be moved when that happens, when you and I genuinely have a faith system in place. My prayer is that's true of your life. And uh, if it's not, you're in the right place today because uh, we're here to help you with that. And so if you're online with us, we are glad that you're here today. And uh, so today, today we're going to stop and pray and that we're going to jump right into the message today. So Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, God, that we as your people have to be together, to love each other, to serve you, God, to learn of you, to reset our faith with you, God. Thank you, Lord, that that is such a great and awesome privilege. And, and today, God, I pray for the next just few minutes that we would have, uh, you would have our undivided attention, God, that you would allow us to put aside all the distractions and all the thoughts that come into our head, God, and help us, Lord, just to focus on you for this next few minutes. Thank you, Lord, for this day. In Jesus' holy and powerful name I pray, amen. Go ahead and be seated. Thank you for braving the smoke and coming out today. We are so glad you're here. If you're online, we're glad that you're here with us too. And, uh, and uh, so what, wherever you're at, I hope that today when you walk out of here or that you f turn the, your television off or your f computer off, you'll say, I was glad that I spent time at Grace Church. That's our hope and that is our prayer. So today we're going to continue in our series, Non-Negotiables. And, and the basis of this series is simply this, is that, that there are certain things in the Christian life that we can have fun and we can debate about and we can talk about and we can disagree and love each other and uh, it's all good. It's all good. There are certain things, however, in the Christian life that are non-negotiable. And these are the things that if you don't believe them, you probably aren't yet a Christian. Not probably, you're not yet a Christian. There are certain fundamentals, essentials in the Christian life that are required by us to believe. And so that's what we're talking about. And, and today we come to what I consider to be the centerpiece of all of Christianity, and that is the resurrection. If I don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus, then I count Jesus as a liar because he said it was going to happen, and it did happen. And it, so it, this is a pretty important thing. So it is essential to our faith for you and I to believe in the resurrection. So the validity of, of Jesus as the God-man rests in this one event. The validity of it rests in this one event. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the crowning proof that Christianity is real, it is amazing. It is a resurrection. If the resurrection did not take place, then Christianity, listen to this carefully. This might be shocking to you. If the resurrection did not take place, then Christianity is a false religion. It's not based on truth. It's not based on, it will be based on a lie. And it would be the greatest scheme that ever happened in the history of the world if the resurrection is not true. But if it did take place, it is a game changer and your Christian faith, the Christian faith is absolute truth and it requires accountability on my part. So the cradle and the cross are of little value. Think about this. Are of little value without the resurrection. If Jesus just came, was born in a manger, and went to the cross and died and didn't resurrect from the dead, according to the scripture, we'd still be in our sins. It's the resurrection that gave proof and gave validity to all of that all of that truth, it is so important that you and I understand that. So here's the formula. It's the cradle plus the cross plus the resurrection equals eternal life. You can't, can't take any one of those out. You can't take the cross out. You can't take the virgin birth out. But, what you, but, but you certainly can't take the resurrection out. So the resurrection makes Christianity, if you hearing what I'm saying, it makes Christianity the most irritating religion on the planet. It does. If the resurrection is true, think, think about this, especially to other world religions, because all they have is a dead prophet. We have a risen Savior. I mean, how, how good is that, right? We have a risen Savior. And so that must be quite irritating to others when we talk about the risen Savior. And uh, so, so think about how important that is. 
Now, let's talk about the resurrection for just a few minutes. And then what I want to transition to today, I'm going to just tell you where I'm going and then I'm going to go there. Um, I, want, I want to spend the majority of our time not on the resurrection itself, but on the fact of what it produces in our life. What difference does it make if I believe in it? That's where I want to really kind of land on. But before I get there, I want you to be solid that the resurrection happened and it was powerful and it's a part of God's plan. So what happens when a forensic detective goes to Calvary, goes to Israel to investigate what transpired after Jesus' death? Well, we can know that because there's this guy by the name of J. Warner Wallace. That's him right there. Almost right there he is. Almost right there. Timing is everything, right? And so, so uh, that's him. And he's a forensic detective. And he specializes in cold cases. Now this was, he's an atheist, by the way. He was an atheist. So this is, a pretty, this is a pretty major cold case because normally when a cold case happens, it's five years old, 10 years old, maybe 20 years old. This is 2,000 years old. This cold case is 2,000 years old. He's an atheist, and it spurred his interest because of his profession. And honestly, he went there because he wanted once and for all to put this, to put this behind him, and so it wouldn't bug him. And so he was looking for the truth, but he was looking through the eyes of an atheist. And he was asking the question, rightfully so, did, did Jesus really rise from the dead? So he went. And, and as he did this investigation, Wallace came away utterly convinced that the resurrection was true. After all of his investigation, he was convinced that the resurrection was true. And when you think about how powerful that is, you know, a Christian could go there, and we would look for reasons to believe in the resurrection, right? Come on, talk back to me. It's okay. We would look for reasons to believe in the resurrection, but an atheist is going to go there probably with a bent saying, I want to prove this is wrong. So he goes with that bent, and he proves to himself at least that, the, that he believes there's enough evidence to say that the resurrection actually happened. And he said that there were four things that he concluded. And he said neither foes or friends can deny these things. First of all, he concluded that Jesus did in fact died, die on the cross and was buried. Historical evidence, he dug it all out. He looked at what was in the writings. He looked at, he entered, he looked at all. He looked at historical accuracy of those writings. And he concluded that Jesus died and was buried. The second thing he concluded was that Jesus' tomb was empty and no one ever found the body. It was empty. There was an empty tomb. And you have to know something about that culture in that time. There was a lot riding on that body. So there was a lot of money put out in the city of Jerusalem for anyone who could find the body. This was a big deal. Not having a body was a big deal. Thirdly, Jesus' disciples all believed that they saw the resurrection of Jesus, saw him in his resurrected form. Saw him. All the disciples in fact, all the disciples, this is the fourth point, all the disciples were transformed following their alleged res this alleged resurrection. They were transformed so much so that 11 out of the 12 disciples gave themselves to a martyr's death believing in the resurrection. That's pretty historically powerful because if I was propagating a lie, if they were propagating a lie for their own benefit, because that would be the only reason, if they were propagating a lie for their own benefit and they were brought into a, a council and said, listen, all you have to do is, is just deny it and we'll let you go. We're not going to execute you. Just deny it. I don't know about you, but if it was a lie, I would deny it. I would. If I, if I knew it was a lie, I wouldn't die for something I didn't really believe. If I was just using it to gain money, I would go, gosh, I could go to work for a Walmart, you know. There would be other ways to make a living. So those four things he concluded, and he walked away, moving away from his atheism, putting his faith in the risen Lord Jesus, and it is a powerful thing. So with that in mind, here's what I want to do with this for just a few minutes. I want, I want you to pretend for just a minute uh, that you have this ability to step into a time capsule and that you can transport yourself back 2,000 years. So here we go. We're going to go back 2,000 years. You're in the city of Jerusalem. And, are you there? Okay, okay, I'm just checking because some of you are just daydreaming. I, you're looking at me like, what's he talking about here? So you're in the city of Jerusalem and you are, 
you, you, you hear this noise, and you look up, and you see all this, this huge crowd, thousands of people gathered together, and there's this guy that's up in front, and he's talking, and you don't know what he's talking about, so you inch closer, and you want to you you eavesdrop into this conversation to know exactly what's being said. And so there's this guy that's opening up a text, an ancient text, in fact, a text that was written a thousand years before this guy spoke, and this guy's name was Peter. He was one of the disciples. And so you're going, okay, what, what does he have to say about this? So he opens up a text, and he's reading from this text, and he is quoting King David, the most famous and most powerful king of all of, his, all of Israel, and perhaps of any kingdom for what he accomplished. You know, the bottom line is this was a powerful dude. And so he's reading the, these words, and we find this and discover this in Acts chapter 2. So if you brought a Bible, that's where we're going to spend a little bit of time together today. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 25, this is what it says. King David said this about, uh, said this about him, speaking of the Messiah. King David is speaking about the Messiah. That's what the text says. And this is what it says. I see the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is, my, he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. This was written by David. So Peter gets up, and he says, hey, guys, listen to this very carefully. David wasn't talking about himself here. Because guess what? There's his tomb right there. So Peter gets up, and he says, David's dead. No question about that. David's still in the grave. David's tomb is still with us. He was not speaking of himself, but he was speaking of Christ the Messiah. This Jesus that you put to death, God raised him from the dead. This Jesus that a few days ago you were shouting out, crucify him. This Jesus that you yelled that out towards, this Jesus God raised from the dead. And when Peter spoke those words, the Bible tells us that the crowd was cut to the heart because they knew everything he said was true. David's tomb was still there, couldn't be spoken of. This, they couldn't be spoken of David himself. This had to be the Messiah. And so that day, thousands of people repented of their unbelief and turned to Jesus. Thousands that day. Historical day in the church. It was the birth of this amazing thing. The Spirit of God was involved in all of this. It was an amazing event. Read Acts chapter 2, and I'm telling you honestly, this resurrection changed the history and tra trajectory of the world. It did. And it can change your life if you allow it to. So having said all of that, I'm going to trust and believe that I build a case here that the resurrection is solid, that it... It would take a lot of faith not to believe in the resurrection based on the historical evidence. So having said that, now I want to transition and I want to talk a little bit about, so what difference would the resurrection make in my life? Because Bible doctrine is not just intended to be, for us to sit around in rooms and go, oh, that was good. Bible doctrine isn't about, you know, stuffy theologians talking about arguing about things and coming to conclusions and writing papers on them. Bible doctrine, truth out of Scripture, is made to change lives. It's designed to change lives. Every major doctrine, every major truth that you and I will discover from the Scripture, God's intent for you, is for you and I to take that in and to see a life-changing result out of, out of that experience. Whatever that is. But this in particular, this resurrection, this is on a 1 to 10 scale of 20 in terms of its importance. So let's talk about how it's going to affect your life. If you chose today to put your whole confidence in the resurrection, what difference would it make for you? So I'm glad you asked that question because I'm going to spend just a few minutes in answering that. So the first thing that I'm going to suggest is what the text that we just read says is that the first thing that it produces in my life is a tremendous amount of security. I'm secure. When I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, literally, when death has been conquered, what, what's bigger than death that you know of? Anything? Anybody? What's bigger than death? 
I mean, that's it. That's the biggest enemy that you and I face is death. If it's been conquered, then everything else is not such a big deal, right? Everything else is temporal. Everything else is, you know, unconsequential in light of eternity. But this thing called the resurrection has changed the game. And it has changed my level of security. Verse 25 says, I see the Lord is always with me. I'll not be shaken. David wrote this. I'll not be shaken, for he is right beside me. So this passage says that uh, Jesus produces in my life, this resurrected Jesus Christ produces a sense of security in my life. I can be secure. I don't have to be fearful. I can, my levels of anxiety, I, we live in an anxiety-plagued world, right? And the world's solution, sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong. The world's solution is let's just medicate, right? That's how the world looks at things. Let's just medicate. What if there was something bigger and better than meds? What if my anxiety levels could come way down by a certain faith system, the shield of faith that is able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil? And what if that were true? What if I could, and I'm not suggesting medication is evil. Don't hear me say that at all. Some people, you know, have reasons to be on it. I'm just simply saying that as a general rule of thumb, when you look at culture and you look at the anxiety levels of what's happening in our culture, rising and rising and rising, and everybody's, you know, on the verge of, you know, being, you know, a road rage guy, you know, just because of anxiety and because of all the things that are happening within our culture. What if security in my life happened because I was putting my confidence, my whole confidence, not part confidence, my whole confidence in this historical fact of the resurrection. And if death is now conquered for me, then whatever else is left in the short time that I have on this planet isn't going to be that big of a deal if I truly believe in the resurrection. A story was told by, about an African Muslim who became a Christian. And his friends asked him, well, why did you convert to Christianity? And this is how he answered. It's brilliant. He says, well, it's like this. Suppose you were going down a road and suddenly the road forked in two directions and you didn't know which way to go. And at the fork, there were two men, one dead, one alive. Who would you ask directions from? <laughs> That's the truth. The resurrection is the way to go. The second thing that I see in this text, the second result of the resurrection is, and we're going to camp on this a bit, is that what happens with the resurrection is when I put my whole confidence in it, I'm granted hope. It is a source of hope inside of my life. And here's what you need to know. The commodity that this world needs now more than anything else is hope. Hope is a game changer. Hope is a game changer. Without it, people die. With hope, People find miraculous recovery from all sorts of things in their life. Once I lose hope in my life, it is game over because then what happens is when I lose hope, then I'm just, I'm just sentenced to darkness, to live in the darkness. But if I have hope, then I don't have to live in that darkness. And that's why this is so important. So verse 26 says, No wonder my heart, my heart is glad. My tongue shouts his praises. My body rests, say it, in hope. That's when you were supposed to say it. <laughs> we're having a little communication problem here today. <laughs> Me and you together. I mean, I, I don't know what's happening here. My body, my body rests in hope. hope is a product of the resurrection. Do you see that? The hope that God given is just amazing. Hope is not just wishful thinking. It's not. Hope is not about optimism. You know, there are two kinds of people in the world. There's optimists. And there are pessimists. How many optimists do we have in, in, the, in the room? Raise your hand. All right. You, you see the glass half full. How many pessimists do we have? You know, everything is wrong. You know, I'm going to get up and you know, the dog is probably going to die today. I don't know, what, I don't know what's going to happen today, but something bad is going to happen in my life. So here's the good news for everybody. Hope has nothing to do with optimism or pessimism. It has another ingredient that is completely different than that. Because oftentimes, we, you know, we, people who are optimistic, you know, they, they naturally have this hope. But let me show you something that I think is really powerful. Um, hope 
is really something different than optimism. Desmond Tutu once said, Hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness. So let's camp on that for just a second. It's like this. Let's say you go on a hike and your friends tell you about this trail that you can hike on. And there is a, there's a shortcut you can take to get to the top of the summit and there, it involves going through a tunnel. And the tunnel is pitch black. So you hike this trail and you see a tunnel, but actually there's a couple options. You're not sure, is this the right tunnel or is this the wrong tunnel? So you say, well, I'm going to take a choice. I'm going I'm to go through this tunnel. So you get inside this tunnel. And you have a flashlight in your backpack. You pull it out and, you're, you know, it's pitch black in there. It's dark. It's black. So all of a sudden, the worst thing in the world, you're 300 yards into this tunnel. And the worst thing that you could imagine happens, your flashlight goes out. And it is dark. I mean, have you ever been in that kind of darkness, pitch black? I'm not just talking about bedroom darkness. I'm talking about pitch black. I mean, I can remember going to Alcatraz as a visitor one time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the tour, the tour thing you go on, you get to come out. You get to come out when you go on a, on a tour. And so they asked us if we wanted to, you know, we're down and going through the, this tour. And the guide, now they do it with, you know, headsets now, but they used to do it with guides. And, and so they said, do you want to experience what it's like to be in the hole? So I'm stupid enough to go, yeah. Yeah, I want, I want that. Surely that can't be bad, right? That can be that bad. So, you know, they put us in there. They shut the door. And I'm telling you, it, was, it creeped me out. And I don't get creeped out easily. You know, I, I don't. But I couldn't see, I mean, you couldn't see anything. You, couldn't, you know, you could put your hand on your head right in front of your face, and you couldn't see your hand. It was that dark. And I'm, the, I'm just thinking, hello, get me the heck out of here. And I wasn't thinking heck there. I just wasn't. <laughs> I was thinking heaven. What were you thinking? <laughs> Come on now. Come on now. This is church. This, you can't think like that. So anyway, so anyway, here we go. That's darkness. So you get in the middle of this tunnel, and your flashlight goes out, and you are in a, like a full-scale panic mode, right? How many would be in a panic moment, mode at that time? I would be. I hate darkness. And so you sit down after you've cried for about five minutes. You remember, you remember that you have some matches in your pocket. Oh, I got matches. I was going to do this kind of lie, but I was afraid I was going to burn myself. So I was going to turn the lights down, and, you know, you know. But I, uh, it would have been good if I screamed when I got burned. <laughs> so, so, he, so you find, you, you remember you have matches, you pull them out, and you, f you know, flick the match, and all of a sudden, just a glimmer. The match only lasts for just a few seconds. A glimmer of light happens, and you can see the trail in front of you. And you can actually, for just a second, for just a second, you can see that there's light Somewhere down there, you can see just a reflection of some kind, and you see you have this sense of hope. That's how hope works. What God gives us in the middle of our darkness, whatever you're going through, in the middle of our darkness, He gives us, gives us a spark of light that allows us to have confidence enough to keep on the journey. That's the hope that God gives to us. Hope, then, is a confident expectation. That's what it is. Hope is a confident expectation. I can have confidence, and it's not just wishful thinking. It is a confident expectation. Thirdly, if I have a solid belief and hope in the resurrection, and I don't just talk, I'm not talking about, yeah, I intellectually accept it. I'm talking about I'm banking my whole life on the resurrection, that kind of faith. If that's the case, the next thing that it brings into my life is a sense of meaning or purpose. It brings meaning. Verse 28 says, You have shown me the way of life. Do you see that phrase? You have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. See, purpose, this is really, this is good. This is worth writing down and thinking about. Purpose always trumps happiness. Did you know that? Our culture seeks after happiness, but we should be seeking after purpose. You know why purpose trumps happiness? 
Because purpose always brings something greater than happiness. And you know what's greater than happiness? It's joy. So that's why when I pursue, when I sue, when I, when I pursue the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when I believe on it, it produces in my life this sense of a desire to know the meaning of life and what God wants for my life. For my life. And then what it does is that that produces in, itse- in and of itself joy in my life. So because happiness is greater than joy, then there's great joy in knowing that I'm at, there's no greater joy than this, than the, to know that I'm in the center of God's will right now. Time out. Do you know that? That right now, you currently are in the center of God's will. Do you have that kind of confidence? Because if you don't, here's what's going to happen. You're not going to, your joy is going to come and go. Anybody here want joy in their life? Anybody at all? Anybody out there? I'm hearing an echo, echo, echo. I'm sorry. Now I'm back. So here we, you see, here's the thing, is that if I want joy in my life, it comes from a solid knowledge that I'm in the center of God's will because you live with the hope of this resurrection. So if you want this kind of life, being in the center of God's will, if you want If you want the kind of confidence to be a purpose-driven Christian, how do I get it? Where do I start? How do I become, how do I, how do I get that? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked again. Here's how I've discovered it in my life. I've never read this. I'm just going to tell you if you're like an old guy telling young people how I got a confidence of being in the center of God's will. So here's where I started. I just started by being faithful in the very smallest things in life that I could do. After I became a Christian, I just started never saying no to God, whatever he would ask me. But in particular, I started with the small things. You start by offering up what you have, no matter whether it's talent or treasure, no matter how little or how much you have, you start where you are and you offer that up. To God. That's where you start. That's the discipline of learning to grow in this process. Um, so let me see if I can explain it even deeper from a Bible story. John chapter, John chapter 6, Jesus has been teaching crowds all day. They're following him, you know? And who wouldn't want to follow? Here's the guy, here's the guy that he's God. And when he speaks, people listen, he reveals the Father. And so there's these thousands of crowds that come out, 5,000 to be exact, out in the middle of the desert. Jesus is teaching all day, and he realizes they're hungry. And he goes to the disciples. He already knows what he's going to do. He goes to the disciples, and he asks them, where can we buy food to feed all these people? 5,000 people in the middle of Black Rock Desert, right? Where are we going to go? Where are we going to go to feed these people? And uh, one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, hey, uh, I was surveying the crowd a while back, and I saw, this is a transliteration, I'm just making the story up based on the text. I saw a young kid, a, a young boy that has five barley loaves and two fish. And then he adds this, but that's a drop in the bucket for a crowd like this. None of the disciples had faith that Jesus could do it. So then Jesus does his thing. He takes from this boy two fish, five barley loaves, and he feeds 5,000 people. That's a miracle, right? And I'm guessing that if you wanted to have seconds, you could. There was enough left over. That's how God does it. That's how God does it. But the story that I want to show you today has to do with you and me. Where do we start? You know where we start? We're just that kid. Have two fishes and and five barley loaves, and the Savior needs it? Sure. That's what I'll do. I'll just offer up my two fish and five barley loaves. That's where you start on a journey with God. You start doing that as a pattern of your life. You say, oh, you know that Reno Love thing? The church needs us to show up and pick up trash so that the city of Reno can see that there is 
people who actually love them and care about them so that we can tell them about Jesus when they come to church here? Oh, I can, I can do that. It's, five, it's just two fishes and some barley loaves. That's all it is. You just start with a pattern of never saying no to Jesus, never saying no to him. You're just that kid. You're just that kid that if there's a need, you just say, here's what I got. It doesn't have to be a fortune. It doesn't have to be all. You don't have to, you don't have to be the next Billy Graham to speak for Jesus. You, don't, you just give your time and your treasure and your talent unto him, and you say, whatever God you want, that's, and you do that, for, and then one day you wake up and you look in the mirror like I have recently and go, dude, how did, how did this happen? How did this happen? But you realize that it happened slowly and precisely being in the center of God's will. It's not, brain, it's not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. It's a very simple thing. The last thing that I think that eternal life brings, and this is found in another text, it's found in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, and this is what it says. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. What do I have to do to be saved? First of all, what does the word saved mean? You have a lot of people that come to grace that, you know, don't come from religious backgrounds. What does the word saved mean? It means delivered. Delivered from what? Delivered from what? And the answer to that question is, is simply this, and this is something that I think a lot of people don't understand. God has many attributes to his nature. He has, he's the God of love, right? We love that part of God. Who doesn't love the love of God? And then there's the holiness of God. And the holiness of God requires justice and requires a payment for your sin. Instead of making you pay for that sin, he offers you two choices. Either you do it or Jesus does it. I mean, it's pretty simple. But when I'm saved, I am, listen to this carefully, this is where I'm going with this. When I'm saved, I am saved from God's wrath himself. I'm literally saved from God. God saves me. His, I'm saved from his wrath. And I saved based on my confidence, my hope, and my trust, and my confession with my mouth that Jesus was raised from the dead. So I want to end with this thought. And I'm going to preface it by saying this has nothing to do, this is not a political statement of whether you should be vaccinated or not vaccinated. You got that? I mean that with all my heart. I want to tell you a story from history that has nothing to do with that, and I don't have an agenda except the gospel here. So in the early 1900s, this country had a problem with blood poisoning. And people were dying right and left from blood poisoning. And some really smart people figured out the cure, penicillin, penicillin. And so they started bringing penicillin to the general population. And, and uh, this was a game changer in the history because this, this was wiping people out, this penicillin. And I dare say that there's probably nobody in this room that hasn't had penicillin or a derivative of it. For probably If you have, you're the rare exception. This was a game changer in the history of medicine. So let's think about that. Comes in a bottle. I can accept that that, that bottle exists, but it does me no good. I can just say, yeah, what a pretty bottle. That's awesome. I may trust in its ability to cure blood poisoning. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen people get cured. But that doesn't mean no good either. Nothing will change unless I roll up my sleeve and say, I'll take it. I'll receive it. That's the gospel. Nothing changes. And again, no political statement here, whether you should or you shouldn't. get. Don't even go there in your mind. I'm talking about the gospel here. But here's what I know for sure. If you don't receive the gospel, you will die in your sins. That's inevitable. And if you believe in the resurrection and put your hope and confidence in Christ, you will live eternally. You'll have life. You'll possess it starting today. You'll have that life. That's what the Bible says. I am the resurrection and the life. 
and he who believes in me shall never die. That's powerful promise. So here's what I want to do. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with no one looking around. If you're on, watching online, I want you to do the same. You know, I just want you to bow your head with me in reverence to God. So I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to put your confidence, to put your hope, to put your trust, to confess with your mouth that Jesus is who he said he was and that he rose from the dead. And so if you've never done this, I'm asking you right now to transfer your trust from yourself. You can't save yourself. Only Christ can save you. Transfer your trust to the person of Jesus and his resurrection by praying with me right now these truthful words in your heart with sincerity. Dear God, I cannot save myself. Only you can save me. I trust that Jesus died and rose again and I confess with my mouth and my lips that I'm putting my confidence today in that truth. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me right now, if you're here on campus, I'd like you to raise your hand. Just say, if you prayed that prayer with me, yes, God bless you. If you're online, I want you to type in the notes, today I confessed Jesus' resurrection as my resurrection. Now, I want you to all look about me for just a second. If the resurrection, this is, this is solid truth. If the resurrection is not true, then what you and I should have done is that we should have spent our hour together at a bar downtown if the resurrection is not true. If the resurrection is true, then I should live every second wanting to glorify Him the rest of my life. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If the resurrection is not true, our life and faith is futile. But if it is true, then it is a game changer. And you cannot be in the middle here. It's either one way or the other. It's either in or out. You choose. I confidently put my trust that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. And oh, by the way, we'll talk about this sometime in the future. He's coming again. <laughs> Father... Father, thank you for this great truth today. And I pray, I just want to celebrate everyone who prayed, whether online or with us here in the auditorium. God, thank you for your great grace in our life. Thank you, God, for the resurrection of Jesus. It is our confidence and hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you all stand with me as we worship together?
this morning. My prayer is that we will walk in that hope this week, that we will walk in that, that he is alive. And I'm just excited for the rest of this week if we walk in that. And as we leave today, just a couple things before we go. If you need prayer for anything, or if you made a decision today, uh, right outside these doors here in the pews, you can just go ahead and grab a seat and a prayer team member will come and meet with you and pray with you. Also over here we have Kaylee with our seven minute meeting sign. Hold it up nice and high so everybody can see. If you just head over to her for our seven minute meeting, you get to hear why we exist as a church, why we do what we do, and you get to meet with Pastor Dan. Great opportunity to connect. And also, Pat Barrett tickets. Don't forget to grab those in the lobby on your way out. Other than that, we'll see you next week. Have a good one.